Good afternoon, one and all. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry that I had to stand in between your lunch and uh, this presentation, but I will. I promise you, I will keep it as short as possible and as interesting as I, I can. Um, before I jump into the, the presentation, I'm Tripti Panikir. Um, I'm from the University of New Mexico, and my co-author Sangeet Espinay. I don't know. He was supposed to join us through Skype, but I don't know. Technical difficulties. Uh, so I'll just take the ship ahead, I suppose. Um, so we will be talking, uh, talking as you can see the topic. Um, okay. Before I jump into the, con uh, the presentation, I would urge you all to read this excerpt from a book. Uh, just, just as a prelude. Um, and I'll give you a few minutes to so do that. <coughs> Discuss this. I think some people's calling us in. Oops. Hey, so if, uh, I'm just going to continue talking, okay? Okay, yeah. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, you're fine. Okay. So, before I talk about um, this slide, I'll just go ahead and ask you. Um, why did you buy the house that you live in now in the particular city that you bought it? Okay. Why does Sarah feel homesick when she is at a conference like this? Or why does Matthew actually live in a rundown house even though he can afford a much better house? Does anybody want to answer that? I guess not. <laughs> I'll answer that for you. Because home is our bubble. It's our safe space. You know, it's, it's where we feel most comfortable. And we sure like our bubble in a particular way. We love the colors that we have, we love the amount of light we have. It is, it is mostly because of the preference that we have gathered all throughout these years. And I want to say this particular my space idea comes from that personal preference of different objects, different colors, lights, just like, just like I explained. And um, these particular preferences actually come from your childhood, is what they say. Because you have grown up in a particular space that you seem to think that you like, because that's what you've grown up with. And uh, that is what you start to call home, just like you read in that excerpt of that book. It says, this is home, because you start relating to the word home or homeliness to that one feeling or one space that you were first put into. So this presentation is not about architecture per se in its decorative existence or real estate value, but it is actually about that um, subtle feeling that you develop in this space that you've called your home or dwelling. In your past, in your present, it could be different things. Um, so that is what this presentation is about. And just like I have on the slide, it says, the home is actually the mental landscape of one's consciousness. It, um, it sort of uh, makes you a person as it is, or as you are right now. Um, going on to the next slide, I'd like to talk about, uh, I'm not sure how many of you have read The Architecture by Peter Zimpler on Thinking Architecture. Anybody here? Okay, so he actually opens his uh, article talking about this particular doorknob that he had in his aunt's garden. So every time he saw or felt that doorknob or something similar to that, he was reminded of these happy times, the smell of the good food, and things like that. He would talk. He goes on to talk about these um, staircases that were waxed staircases. So this particular touch of this doorknob, uh, this particular feeling, brought him back to this sense of homeliness, and he kept relating that to that sense of homeliness. And he also talks about, further down in the article, he talks about how when you walk on the gravel, the sound of the gravel, that would also remind him of this home concept. So for Peter Zimter, obviously, that is what he relates to when he talks about home. Um, and we as 
ordinary beings experience architecture on a daily, day-to-day -day basis, but we don't seem to realize this experience of architecture. And that's why I put that as experiential architecture. And Peter Zemfer is actually known for uh, designing um, architecture in that experiential sense. Uh, but having said that, where does one draw the line of architecture? Is it just this design-built space, or is it also this feeling of touching, uh, the feeling of um, the, the sound of the gravel, just like Peter Zimper spoke about? Where do, we, where do we draw that line about architecture? Um, so uh, Zimper in his article actually says that uh, memories contain the deepest architectural experience one has. Uh, if you talk to somebody about their dream, there is a landscape that they set, or a scene that they set. And architecture is actually part of even that. So for us to draw that line, what architecture is, is it that feeling, is it that when you're walking through a space, you have sun coming in in a particular way. Is that also architecture? So that is what we're trying to understand. <clears throat> um, going on to the next slide, um, what I like to call subconscious memory. Throughout our lives, just like I said, uh, we live in houses, uh, different houses, we've all lived in different houses. And there is, a, there is a particular imprint that our brain forms from these memories that we have had in these different houses. Uh, a, a good example uh, trying to explain this particular imprint that I'm talk, trying to talk about is there was an experiment conducted in the 1970s by Keegan, I think you should be familiar with these experiments. No, no, I'm talking about you, but never mind. Okay, <laughs> so what happens in this exper experiment is um, they actually um, showed a few images to infants. Now these images were some were uh, images of um, human beings and some were distorted images, uh, distorted faces, some were just images. So what they were trying to see is how this infant actually, or to see if the infant actually reacts to these images. And what was noticed that um, infants, are, uh, as they reached that four month age, uh, they actually did start to recognize faces that were not distorted. Mm -hmm. Meaning they've actually imprinted in their brain saying that, okay, this is how a face looks. Mm -hmm. So going back again to our first slide, this is how my home looks, or this is how my home should be. And also, we will talk about it later, this also in a way creates, this is how my home should not be, or I don't want it to be. So these are mental imprints that we want, I mean, we, uh, we form from these different experiences that we've had. Um, now, this brings me to another point uh, where we actually, somebody was talking about, um, I think it was you, about the, how people choose where they live. Um, so what I'm trying to say in my um, in our presentation is that um, how do people actually choose their dwelling? It let's say for an example, a particular lady buys this house and she doesn't know why she bought the house. She likes it, but later on she finds out that this particular house reminds her of a deceased aunt or somebody that she was really fond of, because that's in herself, in her mind, saying that this is that happy space that she's had. Um, same thing with another girl, another man who might have not known why he rents this particular odd looking house. But it's actually a replication of the house that he lived in as childhood. So these are things that we unconsciously do because of this imprint that we've had in our mind. Now, uh, moving on to the next slide, this is actually what I'm talking about. How we started off with this particular project. And this, we started off with this project uh, because of conversations that we've had with several other people that we've known. And uh, the basis of the study, uh, just like I said, uh, what we did is we did a case study. I'll let everybody come in. Thank you for joining us. I know I'm in, uh, in between your lunch. I'll make it really quick. So for people who have just missed whatever I was talking about, um, I'll just give you an update. Um, it's, uh, we're talking about how people talk about or feel uh, in a particular space. And we've taken uh, the object of home to try to see how they feel. And this particular presentation is about um, how you feel in a space. 
Okay, and then we talk about what we can do about that. Now, uh, moving on to uh, my case study, or the case study that we did. What we did is we actually spoke to a few um, American born Indians and uh, Indian born Indians who live here now. So, uh, some of these people um, lived in India and have, have had a childhood in India, and obviously have, have, have uh, a mental image of this whole concept called home that I spoke about uh, based in India. And then we have uh, another set of people who are actually Indians, but we were born in the United States and grew up here. And why I, I, we kept it to this particular um, uh, Indian thing is so that we don't have too many uh, factors to try to combine, just because it's, it's only in the starting phase of our uh, re research. So uh, what we did is we asked them uh, several questions, trying to understand what their concept of home actually is. And what we did is we further on went to try to uh, have them map out um, images of their old house in, in terms of plans or views that they remember. And also did one of their current house and also an ideal house. So we sort of had these three different um, images of house that's in their mind. One they have experienced, one they're experiencing, and one they would like to experience, or one that you're looking forward to. Um, so that's what we did. And we had a set of questions that um, we asked them, and I'd be happy to share them uh, with anybody who wants to talk to me after the session. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, and the responses for these uh, questions were exceedingly interesting. And um, what we saw is, um, they interestingly, they reported that when, when we would ask them about what they remember about the house, was they would talk about, oh, I remember only the objects, not particularly about the house, no, I don't remember. But when we start talking to them or started questioning them more, they would talk about this one, okay, one of the respondents actually said that there, was, there used to be one window that I used to look out and I used to see the street, I mean, and I used to fight with my siblings to see the street. Somebody else spoke about, they had this red carpet, and they used to be there, and they didn't remember what exactly they did. Um, the third person actually spoke about um, a brick wall that was in her house. And so I asked her what was on the brick wall. She's like, I don't, I don't really remember what was on the brick wall, but she remembered that she used to be put on time out on that wall, and she remembered how it felt on her back. So then I went on further asking them several other questions. Um, and the first person who spoke about the window experience spoke, said that in his ideal house, he would have a window in his bedroom where he could see the outside. So he lives in a house that's actually, like you call it, a cookie, cookie cutter house, which is not one that he built. <laughs> so in his ideal house, he would have this view. So as you can see, he has related that childhood home into his ideal home, saying that, okay, I want views, and that's what I like. The second particular person that who spoke about the red carpet, um, he does not have a red carpet in this current house, I don't know why, but he did have a small rug uh, next to his um, door that went outside, and the conversation that I had with him, that he constantly kept talking about sunlight, and when I would talk to him about if he had sunlight in his old house, he, he spoke about how the colors on the red carpet changed, when the sun would hit it at different times of the day. So I think that was another thing that he uh, related to. Now this particular person about the brick wall, she actually lives in a house that is completely Venetian plastered. No rough edges, completely round. So I think she probably built an image of that brick wall that she didn't like, because she was put on time out there. So those are images that, as a child, you have imprinted in your brain to that word called homeliness, or home that we've been trying to talk about. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the next slide. Let's see. We have, um, the next is cultural and habit encoded. Um, I would like to talk about the spatial temporal concept of basically perception. You perceive an object uh, from what you have experienced. Just like I said, your home, or the first slide that I spoke about, I showed you. You think this is home because that was your first experience about home. Uh, um, it could be, let's say, I like peach roses. 
because I like them. And I think they look much better than red roses, but that's not what you would think. So these are perceptions that we develop as we grow. And it's the same thing what Mary Pento says. Um, all knowledge garnered from scientific inquiry is original, gained only through one's particular viewpoint. I see this world in my way, and you see it in a different way. <coughs> um, so a good example that I would like to pull out of the, these case studies that we did is um, choice of level of light. Um, just like I mentioned earlier, that um, the study that we did was uh, with American-born Indians and uh, Indians who were born in America but live and born in India but live in the United States. So this particular couple, uh, the husband was born in India and um, he grew up in India, and he likes tube lights in his house. He likes it really bright. And the wife uh, grew up here and she likes bulbs because she feels that the whole a tube light is too much of that. So that's obviously because he grew up with the tube light setting and he thinks that's normal. And she grew up with this bulb setting and she thinks that's normal. So it's, it's actually an interesting uh, thing to try to compare as to what exactly is right. We don't know in a house, right? Um, so I think when you design, well, we will talk about the design uh, in a later <coughs> point. Um, I would like to talk about um, how architecture has its roots in our biological historic city also. Uh, now we all like to uh, get around um, the fireplace and sit and uh, just enjoy the moment. Uh, it's not because we think, oh, it's going to save uh, us from our predators, because we don't really have predators in this world. But millions of years ago, that's what our uh, ancestors did. And it's imprinted in our genes now that it's the safe place. Um, so that was just an example that I'd like to throw out there. The next one is um, fusion of spatial uh, typology. Uh, just like I told you, we have had different people uh, are, are Indians coming in from India, people who already live here. And people, uh, these case study or respondents, uh, when they move from India, they have had to uh, adapt to this particular context that we have here. Now, a good example that I would like to put is in the, in the US or any Western country, when you walk into a door, uh, you have a doormat. In India, we actually have something called kindi. You have a kindi, uh, it's a brass, uh, vessel that has water in it, and you're expected to wash your feet outside and you walk in. So this is the difference that we have here. Uh, so when you move here, uh, some of these respondents actually told me that they miss that whole um, feeling of, you know, that entry. So that they relate to that as their home. Um, and of course, people who have lived, uh, born and brought up here don't seem to relate to that as much. <clears throat> Yeah, so the sit out, uh, sit out in Kerala, we call, um, I'll skip the word, um, and we have the patio here. So the sit out is actually in the front of the house, and it actually acts as a space uh, in before you get into the living house. So if you have people that uh, your acquaintance level is much lower than a close, you would not bring them into the house. You have this whole sit out area, and that's where you would meet them. Um, so these are different uh, cultural differences that we have here in terms of space usage. Space usage. Um, now, coming to the idea of nudge, um, if anybody has uh, uh, read the book uh, Nudge, The Nudge, anybody here has read the book Nudge? Yeah, okay. So I don't have to talk too much about it, but I'll just say for people who have not uh, read it, it's actually a book on psychology and behavioral e economics. <coughs> so what the authors are actually suggesting here is um, choice architecture. Now it's about, um, I'll give you a good example of, that's actually mentioned in that particular book. Um, there was a study that was conducted in uh, <coughs> these school cafeterias where they would try to understand how people eat and if the placement of food actually mattered. Uh, in terms of how healthy these children were eating. So what they did, what the, in their study what they did is they would change the placement of um, the french fries, and the desert, and carrot sticks at different levels. And <clears throat> what they found was that if they had put the carrot sticks at eye level and the french fries tucked away, 
people don't actually pick the carrot sticks to eat them because that's what they're seeing. Even though it's probably not what they want, it's the better choice for them. And what was found that there was actually a 25% increase in better eating while doing this. So what they're trying to suggest is, as optics, we can actually try to nut them into something that's probably best for them without their knowledge. And uh, I don't want to get into the whole side about, oh, people need to be able to choose what they want. But in having said that, it's not in, it's in their best interest that we're trying to do this. And they should have the choice of picking the french fries if they want to, but it's, uh, as designers, what can we do to try to see that this is what they should do? <laughs> So I guess we're coming to a conclusion, um, and so we're still trying to understand what we can do as designers to see uh, how we can design this home for them, just because we're trying to start first with that home concept and try to build that up uh, into different areas. Now I'm somebody who thinks that the whole cookie cutter home thing should not exist to begin with. Because when you're building something for somebody, it needs to be custom. And it could be my architecture side that thinks that, oh no, it needs to be in a particular way. It could be that. But we might as well see if we are designing something for somebody, if it relates to them in that sense, in that perception that they've had, or that image they've created of home or space or whatever it is. So I think it is very important for us as architects and psychologists to try to understand exactly what people want from their space before just saying that, okay, they're going to say, I need three bedrooms, two baths, but what do you want in that space? So that is what we are trying to do here, as nudging your way into architecture. And if I had the chance to design a house of Peterson, then I would surely put that door knob, I would surely put that gravel under his foot so that he could experience what he relates to, which his aunt's house back somewhere with the door knob and the gravel. Thank you so much. Questions and if you guys want to ask them any questions, yes sir. So as the architect, would 